hello there. I'm, today I'm going to look at King Kong films that are the kind of on the cheesier end of things. You know, a good way to uh, work any Kong, because of King Kong vs Godzilla or Godzilla vs Kong is out. So I just thought I'd look at the cheesier end of things, since it's a cheesier end of a film anyway, which just came out. And so it's going to be like the King Kong 76, its sequel, King Kong Lives, there's King Kong Escapes from Toho. I've already covered Kong vs Godzilla from the 60s before, so I'm not going to cover, touch that. You know, then there's uh, the Mighty P. King Man, which is the um, Shaw Brothers Hong Kong version of King Kong, which has come out just after the 76 version. And then there's also Conga, which is the British King Kong ripoff that is also lots of murders in the remark. There's lots of them. So I'm just doing a bunch of them that are just weird Kong movies that are hopefully you'll enjoy. I mean, next week I'll be doing a Frankenstein Conquers the World and uh, all the Grantulas, Grantulas or whatever you call it. So I'll be doing some more kaiju that are weird, but this week I'm just stuck into the Kong. Things are very Kong-like. You know, so I'm hoping you enjoy this one. This is a strange, strange video. This is the weirdest of the week, I think. Although, I've got one coming up that um, is for a film that is weird but for all the wrong reasons. Okay, I'm going to start off with Kong 76, which was the Dino De Laurentiis produced, John Gilliman directed King Kong movie. The, the remake, or as Dino De Laurentiis suggested, the most original movie of all time. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah. He said that. Uh, so yeah, this is the Cheese Fest 76 version. This is like the um, Bad Step Child of the Kong remakes. I mean, you've got the Peter Jackson one, which really you'll think is way too long and self-indulgent. as a very genuine film. And they tried a lot and there were a lot of special, advanced special effects and a lot of CGI and stuff. So the Kong can move around a lot and they're fighting dinosaurs and all that stuff. You see, you've got that. You've got um, Kong and Skull Island, which is the same thing, CGI, but it's better because it's, it's further along the process. It looks good as well. Then you've got this, which actually replaces, you know, stop motion, because the one did not want stop motion, but it's that with a man in a giant monkey suit, or Rick Baker in a monkey suit. Rick Baker was one of the great special effects guys, and this one, he's in a monkey suit. So they took this process back. You know, they were still making Ray Harryhausen films that then. You could have done Kong and hired Ray Harryhausen to do Kong, and it would have been good. You know, he was available. He was doing the Spin Sinbad movie. You could have talked to him and said, look, can you do this, do Kong for us? And it would have been fine. But no, 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 they, they didn't want to. So because there's no stop motion, there is no monsters apart from a giant snake that Kong beats in two minutes. That's the only monster you've got. So you're going to Kong at the Skull Island and they're going to try and save, do the whole King Kong thing where Kong sees uh, the blonde, this time played by Jessica Lang, falls in love with her, runs away with her. They have to go and try and save her through this hellish jungle and turns out there's nothing there. <laughs> Apart from Kong. And a giant snake. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't get what's interesting with Kong in that way. The way the original did and the way the other films did. But it's not a total write-off. I really like this film. But that's the biggest thing that goes against it. I should say I watched all these films uh, using the projector. So that's a big projector I was, I was using. So I saw them as I've seen them in the cinema. Not as big as the cinema, but better than the seen TV. So you got to see how things would look in the cinema a lot more. And this film does, does help seeing the projector. The effects don't look as bad sometimes. But they still look bad. I mean, there are times when Kong's walking, he just walks like a guy walking. And it's quite embarrassing. They try and update it so that um, it's about uh, these guys looking for oil and they find this new thing, place called Skull Island, that, that has a lot of suggestion they're going to have an oil strike. 
they go there to find it. Turns out the oil's not ready yet. You need to be another 10,000 years for the oil to be ready. But they find Kong, so Charles Grodin in a real like, straight part is the bad guy who decides the only way to save his career is to take Kong back. So of course they're going to get Kong. Um, Jessica Lang, the first part, plays Dwan, who's this, this party girl who was in a boat that um, basically sunk during a typhoon. She is found, she ends up in a, a live boat, they find her. Uh, Jeff Bridges plays a guy who's um, like an environmentalist guy who's um, who basically hitches a ride because he wants to get to that island as well. He wants to expose what they're doing, but he also wants to see what's on the island because he's like a primate specialist. He wants to find out about this. So he's a guy, yeah, there's, always one, there's always one character in these films that always are like sympathetic to Kong. They tend to have a character who um, sees him as a victim. Ironically, in the first film, it actually becomes Carl Denham, the original, because he sees what's going on. Way too late to end up building it, but he ended up getting it. Um, and this one is Jeb Bridges' character. He's like the guy who's... Um, he understands this is obscenity. So he, I mean, he gives the best performance in the film. He's always, there's always also one film, character in every film, that gives a bit of better performance. This one is Jeb Bridges. Jessica Lange's in it. She's actually not that bad, but it's her first performance. She's playing a bit of a dummy character. So she's doing her best, but she's still inexperienced. But it's fine. Um, it's just a young actress who still hasn't worked every out yet. She got hammered critically for this for no real reason beyond... People are bitchy. The film itself is fun, enjoyable. Kong, Kong is the fun part of the film because Kong is a total pervert in this film. There's no... I mean, in the first one, there's little bits where he touches the dress and stuff like that. In this one, he's a total pervert. He's looking at her in ways that are utterly perverse. You know exactly what he's thinking. And it's... You know, it's pretty gross. Like... He's always holding her one hand and you always wonder, where's the other hand? You know, don't give the other hand, it might be sticky. <laughs> you know, it's that kind of look he's giving it. That was only we'll ever one hand scene ever. <laughs> During those scenes and it's weird. And it's a strange film. It's a really strange film. But kind of wonderful. I mean, I, I love old school effects, like the 70s effects, but they had to do everything. They didn't have CGI, so they had to do some practical stuff like rear projection, like do weird things with scaling so you've got miniatures and you get rear projection with it. And some of these didn't look real, but watching what they're trying to do with them, the limitations of technology is wonderful, especially since they've been hobbled with the fact that the Laurentis was dumb enough to say don't have stop motion. It's like, the one thing you need in this film, you're not allowing them to have. So they're trying their best. But it is kind of brutal. It's a very brutal film. When Kong gets shot at the end, he gets shot to hell. He really gets shot to hell. So, um... But it is a really enjoyable film. I definitely recommend it. It's a bit long for its own good. But it is enjoyable. It's... it's it's not as good as the original, obviously. But if you can see it, the projected, you can see the production design and the, all the work they put in to this film. They put a lot, so much work into it. And there's lots of even, they go to New York and Kong just walking around. They really put the effort in. They really tried their best and they get clobbered with this monster in a monkey suit. <laughs> this kind of monkey suit as a monster. It just always killed it. But it is a really underrated film. It's very flawed. It's a it's a guilty pleasure movie though. It really is. If then it's a guilty pleasure movie, this is a guilty pleasure movie. Now we go to King Kong Lives. King Kong Lives is uh, uh um I would definitely say this is the worst of all these films I'm covering. It's definitely the worst. But once I get I I managed to get this for three pounds on DVD, but I still project it anyway just to see it and it's it is it's weird. Like, um, Ron Chazette, who, um, did Total Recall and things, he wrote it. I don't have an idea what the hell he's thinking. 
So basically, and John Gilliman, who directed uh, the 1976 version, came back. He must have needed the money. Cause, uh, and Linda Hamilton, just after Terminator, came and did this film. And John Ashton's in it from Maybe There Was Cop and stuff like that. I don't know what the hell anyone was thinking. This is a disaster of a film. This doesn't make any sense. This is get, um, scenes that don't match up to the next scene. Like, characters' motivations are so basic. When people change from being capitalists to being environmentalists without any real explanation. They're trying to make it, the, the characters funny. Like Linda Hamilton and our eventual boyfriend type of thing. She starts out with a scientist, turned into a... Um, she's still concerned for Kong. She's the best thing in the film. <laughs> but she's in a terrible part. <laughs> I'm sure it's good preparation for Terminator Dark Fate for dealing with bad writing. This is this is awful, but it's wonderful. I I I adore. I've seen this film twice now, and I can see myself seeing it again. It's so bizarre. I mean, basically, Kong survives being shot to pieces, then falling off the twin towers. He survives that somehow. They kept him alive for some reason. They kept him alive. Why? They just shot him down. Why would he keep him alive? Ah, uh, but his heart's failing, and he needs a, he needs a heart transplant. But what are you going to do with after you've given the heart transplant? Why you can't, None of this makes sense at all, really. Anytime there's a character explaining anything of why they're doing something, it makes no sense. You're like... Throughout... I mean, the whole thing is like, it's like, my God, what are you doing? So that happens. You, you basically see they find... This as our guy who's the magic lead. He's out in... Um, somewhere in Africa. He finds Kong's mate as female Kong they bring her back they use her blood to tr as a blood transformation so she could have the heart transplant so Kong survives and is now working but they don't want them to get together because they don't want anyone to get too horny or anything even though that could mean they could actually produce more animals of that size this is a, every problem this film could have been solved by people being smart. All the two animals wanted was to be together. You just gave them a little bit of land or something and leave them alone. Maybe get an outback area somewhere. It would have been fine. Instead, the humans panic like idiots the whole time. I mean, in this film, the animals don't even behave that crazy most of the time. They're just getting shot at by rednecks, by army people. Uh, you know... It's a very paceless film. Things just happen, you know. There's a there's a surprise. There's a supposed surprise where Kong apparently dies, but you know he's not dead because it's only halfway through the film. It turns out uh, she's get pregnant by uh, being with Kong, so he has to be apparently dead for all the time it takes for a baby to grow. So nine months basically, a giant ape has disappeared for nine months. An ape that's the size of you know, a building, no one sees for nine months. That's that's the logic we're looking at here. The, the whole thing is so stupid. But whenever time the two apes are together, it's quite enjoyable to watch them because two people in ape suits and these miniature sets, and it's bizarre. And the actors try to be professional, but they've been given some of the worst lines in movie history. They're given the worst material possible. Just some of the war. You're pretty sure someone wrote this drunk and they know they one draft. That's how disjointed it feels. It just it feels terrible. But it's very enjoyable. I mean, I'd highly recommend this film, but don't go in sober. Just don't. It's very enjoyable, but do not do it sober. So, um, that's all I can really say with this one. <laughs> I'm trying to find ways to explain it, trying to make it sound more logical. It does, but every time you try to explain it, it's like, it doesn't make sense either. <laughs> There's nothing here that makes sense. Now we have King Kong Escapes. I mean, logic, I should have done this first since it was the earliest film, but I thought it was best to start with the remake and then its sequel. So King Kong Escapes is a Toho sequel to King Kong vs. Godzilla. So it's the first time Kong has a film of his own where, you know, he's not fighting... King Kong or the army or anything. He's just 
Kong. He's just on his island and, you know, he's having a good old time. They, they come upon him, even though he's very fought Godzilla, they come upon him and look surprised that he exists. The UN having this peacekeeping thing. But I'm not sure, because I've just seen the English version of that, it's because they'll try and make it for the people who might have seen Godzilla and fight Godzilla. I don't know if that's actually the reason, because I haven't seen the Japanese versions. It might have been something completely different. They might have just dubbed something that makes less sense. But there's a character called Doctor Wu. But if he says it in the um, American version, it sounds like Doctor Who. So, oh, it's Doctor Who is the villain. Doctor Who, who looks a bit like John Pert a Japanese John Pertwee. Yeah, anyway, with the same capes and everything, so it's it's always kind of fun of him being a villain, <laughs> you know, if you're a Doctor Who fan. And he's trying to uh, mine this stuff that will oh, have great power supply and getting paid by China to do it. Although they don't mention it's China, but it's obviously China. <laughs> it's a it's a highly powerful communist oriental power that's never called China. You know, it's paid for it. It can't do it with this mechanical Kong because because they looked at the power structure of Kong, so they built up a mechanical Kong to do this thing called the Power of Kong. Yeah, so I mean, the American version is saying they never met Kong, but there's a there's a robot like Kong. Mm. I feel there's some some of the translation was a bit weird. Anyway, also I wasn't paying that much attention to the plot when I was watching. I was just enjoying the weirdness. So if I got that wrong, I'm sorry, but I'm pretty sure that's what it said. <laughs> Anyway, this machine always breaks down anytime it gets close to this power source that they really need to for a new big power supply. Which is funny because in uh, the, the new uh, Kong vs Godzilla movie, it's all about power supply that comes from the monster verse thing, which is kind of similar to this. You know, there's lots of stuff like that. Anyway, so they, they find that Kong has, has a liking for this uh, woman who, this blonde woman who's a part of this peacekeeping force that are investigating Kong and trying to work out his habits. So Dr. Wu kidnaps her, or Dr. Wu kidnaps her, so they can try and kidnaps Kong and are going to make sure that he does what he's told and gets the power supply and, you know, all that stuff. And things happen, and it's um, Honda directs it, Shiro Honda directs it again, like they did Godzilla vs Kong, or Kong vs Godzilla, or whatever. Which, whatever way around it is. And, like with a lot of his films, it's not the most dynamically paced film. But there's a pleasurable craftsmanship to it. This one, you can happily watch, and... You're not following the story that much. I just enjoying the weird visuals, the... Weird combination of, like, miniatures that look very miniature. And men in... Giant... Giants. The men in... Giant monster suits and it's all very pleasurable and absurd and I was not a great time but I was not following the plot at all. I just did not care. <laughs> of course, all he all hell was the end. Everyone fights. People betray each other, you know, and it's you know, and eventually Kong goes mental on, you know, the uh, monster and goes um also destroys the ship that was controlling it all and it's great fun. It's just great fun. But you're not you're not gonna remember anything of the plot details two days later. You're not gonna remember the plot at all. It's just really enjoyable atmosphere and weird Monster Hokum. The plot is threadbare at best. But I highly recommend it as a fun hour and a half just to sit back and relax and enjoy it. Cause it is a lot of fun. I mean um I think that's in some ways, is one of my favourites of this bunch of films. It was my utter favourite until I saw the one I'm going to cover next. This is the mighty Peking Man. I keep on calling it a giant Peking Man for some reason. I heard about this one from Eric, Asian Museum Movie Enthusiast, during the live stream about favourite kaiju movies. I'd never heard of this one before. It was a delight. <laughs> or if I'd heard of it, I didn't really pay attention to it. It was one of those ones that never really got my attention at all. But his description of it made me think, I have to see it. I bought it instantly. 
And it lived up to reputation. It was utterly bizarre and wonderful and it's my favourite King Kong ripoff. It is the best one. It's the Shaw Brothers and they're in total sleaze mode in this film for most of the film and so much of it makes no sense. The first half is a combination of scenes that technically fit together but are just strange. So you, you get someone reading about the myth of the mighty Peking man who comes to a village and destroys it after he escapes from a mountain which he must have been trapped in before and which you get some of the worst effects you've ever seen in a film where the background rear projection is shaking like this as if it's the thing with Star Trek where people the camera shake and the actor shake it's that level with back projection you have all these buildings have been destroyed and it's really quickly cut because you, they're all obviously miniatures it's wonderful, it's a total blast watching this absurd opening sequence. Then you get Johnny, a character played by Danny Lee, who you'll recognise from The Killer. Yep, he starred in The Killer and this film. What a career. <laughs> and he's like the um, long-haired 70s um, stud super adventurer, you know. And everyone calls him Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. Every two seconds, Johnny. Like, half the dialogue is Johnny. So, he's an adventurer who's suffering from a broken heart because his girlfriend, who he was in love with, slept with his brother. He didn't realise it was his brother to start with. You find out he, he's into a room and he's, she's sleeping with somebody and there's an awkward conversation and he leaves and he gets off the job to find a peaking man. Then it's just later on you find out that guy was his brother. And it's never mentioned, it's never brought up beyond how weird it is, but it's, that's whole films like this, is like, things happen, people behave weirdly, and for plot reasons, but no one's ever acts as if they're human, which is part of the charm of the movie, everything's just very, very threadbare, the whole film's very threadbare. The effects are threadbare, the acting's very threadbare, the writing is incredibly threadbare, but it all comes together beautifully make a very threadbare, bizarre film. So they find so um, all the people are killed in a variety of brutal scenes where one guy gets his leg ripped off and uh, you know every time they, like Johnny tells his friends a tragic story and all the friends get killed brutally over the next two or three scenes which is hilarious it's just weird. So like, why would you tell them and then they'll die instantly? It's the worst storytelling ever. Then Johnny gets abandoned because he's not going to give up by the the leaders of the, of the expedition and they'll, they'll sneak out one night when he's sleeping. Yeah, that happens. Then Johnny runs into this white girl, this blonde white girl who's um, Tarzan up in the jungle because she was playing crash as a child. Her parents died and the mighty Peking man looked after her and brought her up. And now she's a hot 20 year old with lots of makeup. Yep. You even see a bit of makeup that's from the plane as well, as I have to say. This is the explanation. You know. And she's wearing the skimpiest clothes possible. I mean, there's. there's um, so she's only one strap and one bra thing. The other strap is just left hanging so that it can pop out every so often so you can see a lot of nipple. But they can see, no, we didn't mean it. <laughs> you know. It's, and she's wearing that the whole film. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the producers are, ter are perverse. And, you have, and the leader of the expedition is a total pervert. He's a rapist. He's based a rapist. And he's the most awful character you can possibly imagine in a film. You might as well call him, call him Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> he really... <laughs> and he's like constantly messing things up. So even though he's completely abandoned them all, these characters are so stupid that... When they go back with giant Peking man, they trust him to take him and show him off and protect him. Even though this guy's a sleazy bugger who treats everyone horribly. Then things make contracts that binds them to him, and he's the most awful person in the whole film. But we haven't. Well, I jumped past the most amazing part of the whole film, where you get the love scenes with the, with the lead and the lead actress fall in love, and you have the scenes with them playing with tigers. They actually had actors next to tigers playing around with tigers and rolling with tigers. 
and at one point, the actress, during the romantic music, she has a tiger on her shoulders, turning around like this and this, and swinging around, and you're watching the tigers too the whole time. Going, you know, basically, cats, if they're, they're doing little swishes with their tail, they're getting really angry. It's like, you better get away from them quick. And the tigers do that, and you're like, what the hell did they make this actress do? Holy shit. <laughs> It's, it's amazing. Basically, after they come back, obviously, the Peking man in Hong Kong gets treated badly. The Johnny runs into his old uh, flame who betrayed him. And, of course, the romantic confusion follows for like two seconds in an embarrassing scene. Every scene's embarrassing, really. <laughs> That's what's great about the film. And, basically, the... Producer guy tries to rape the native woman. The Peking man sees it through a window from a distance. He goes mental and absolutely starts tearing the place apart to find him. Gets the guy eventually through a whole bunch of chase sequences. And, but there's lots of models of like um, buildings getting destroyed and uh, cars on a motorway and the motorway is getting destroyed and... Wonderfully cheap looking, just really cheap looking, but really enjoyable to watch because it's Hong Kong and destroyed, which is then destroyed in you know, Godzilla v Kong. I've seen Hong Kong destroyed twice in a week. You know, that's great. Um, <laughs> and basically, he gets a guy from the building, top of the building, and just drops him. And Hong Kong don't realise, you're not meant to see the guy hit the ground because it's just a guy hitting the ground and looking awkward. It looks really stupid. And I bet every time someone's dropped, they always seem to see them landing. It's like you're meant to imagine that a bit in a, in a casual film. You're not meant to see it. Because you never do it the way your imagination has it. You want to see lots of blood when people land like that. Anyway, they decide they're going to... So you have these Brits, because it was Hong Kong ruled by the Brits at that point, and they are trying to decide what to do with... Peking man, as he's climbing the building, they're doing the King Kong thing, top of a tall building. They decide to destroy him and, and fill the um, water sprinklers with gasoline to blow him up and set him on fire. And it's just crazy. You end up seeing a guy in a monkey suit, burnt, you know, on top of this big set. It's, it's amazing, it's really dark. Also, really dark as a girl dies at the end. The girl pretty much gets it. It's, it's like, um, more I suggested, she's dead. And, well, that's what I assumed anyway. And it's just brutal and it's horrible. Um, some of the stuff's horrible what happens to people. It's just the most brutal thing. It's a total exploitation movie with really cheap special effects and a King Kong plot. It's wonderful. I, I highly recommend it. Just try and see it. It's available on streaming just now. You can actually get it. I got it for a five on streaming. It was worth every penny. It's just so wrong, but so right. So, um, go see it. Finally, we have Conga, which is a British uh, casu film. Um, I'll probably, I'm going to say a lot less than this one, actually, because I saw it a year ago. I haven't watched it since. Um, but it is wonderful. Mainly it's wonderful for two reasons. Two reasons it really works. One, Michael Goff as the villain. He's the guy who finds Conger. He brings Conger back from the jungles to show off, to prove his theory right. But he has lots of enemies, so he uses a serum to make Conger go and kill them, a la, a la Modern Remorg. And it's great. He's a total scumbag throughout it. You want to see him die horribly. He's like a sexual abuser and everything. He, anybody who he likes, he assumes they're going to sleep with him. He's just terrible. He's he's actually worse than the producer in um, Mighty P. Kingman, but he's probably a much better actor. The character is the most awful scumbag imaginable. It's great to watch him every second. He's on film, you know. He's really have he's just tuning the scenery, as he does in a lot of these sixties, fifties, sixties British horror movies. He knows how to chew the scenery. Um, and then we've also got the ending with Conga after the woman is betrayed by Michael Goff's character. She gives Conga the serum. And he grows wildly into a Kong-like creature who can attack, destroy buildings, attack Big Ben and all this stuff. And he, it's, they have no money for this and it looks so cheap and it's hilarious to watch. And it's so wonderful watching the British try to do a kaiju movie and fail in the worst possible way. 
But I'd highly recommend for those two reasons. Just the giant monster at the end and Michael Goff. Michael Goff especially. He's just horrible in this film. He's just played the most horrible character imaginable in this film. He's he's so good at it though. It's so much fun. But Kong is definitely one you have to see. It's unmissable. So those are the those are the sleazier, weirder Kong rip-offs that you should or sequels or remakes, whatever you should see. They're all worthwhile. I wouldn't say any of them you could describe as good. <laughs> but they're all worthwhile. <laughs> they're all really enjoyable, but they're enjoyable in a certain way. So I hope you enjoyed this video. This, um, it's probably as trash as you expected from when you saw the, the, the image <laughs> come up. So um, I'll be back later with um, probably some saner films than this. Well, maybe one's not. Right, bye for now.